Jim Lauderback from Revision 3. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. And uh, before we were rolling, we were kind of talking about business models and things like that. And I kind of want to digress to that, if, if you're willing, sure. to talk about you, you, you've been in this industry for a long time and kind of, I guess, everything from cable operators to you have cable, you know, the Comcast of the world, you have the, the cable networks like the CNNs and the ESPNs. Um, where are we currently in terms of, you know, a CNN can go direct to consumer. So w what are kind of the, the, the almost the, the judo battle battles going on between like a CNN and a Comcast. I mean, they, they benefit from each other, but they have diverse interests and want to each explore new things. Well, there are a couple different dynamics at play here. I mean, you think about the cable networks, the cable networks agreements that they have with the cable operators, so CNN or ESPN with Comcast, every household that they're in, Comcast pays CNN, ESPN, DIY, Food Network, a couple dollars, a couple cents per household. So take ESPN for example. Every house that has ESPN on cable, five dollars of their cable bill goes to ESPN, whether they watch it or not. Now that relationship's been good for the cable operators, right? It's been great. They get money whether people watch them or not. It's been good for the you know the the the, the cable systems, but it hasn't been so good for consumers. Because if I don't like sports, I'm still paying five bucks for ESPN. So technology is really, so the, the, the history of media and technology has been, as, as technology has allowed those things to change, even though the forces have kept change from happening, change happens anyway. I mean, look at the music industry, right? They want to like, they want to protect their package, get that CD business, they want to protect that forever. Technology, even though they held onto it and forced people not to use Napster, they still did. And that business is mostly over. So even though the sort of cable, the, the, the affiliate fees that the, the cable operators pay to the networks is a great business for them, it's not great for consumers. And I think it's going to change. It's also interesting if you think about the affiliate agreement. So when a, a channel, and I started up a channel, I was in the launch team of ZDTV, which became K Tech TV. When we negotiated our carriage agreements with DirecTV, Comcast, with Time Warner, in them were things that said we would only put a certain amount, we only could put a certain amount of our content each week up on the internet. I think it was it's either 10% or 10 hours or something like that. You know, those and, and, and this was back in what year? This was in 97, 98, okay. 99, 2000. Well, those agreements are all being renegotiated. I mean, they get renegotiated every five, 10 years. And you can just see those negotiations happening. So you, you look at you know, CNN going, to the, well, you know, I want to put it all up there. And Comcast saying, well, okay, but I'm not paying you a dollar per household. Because if everything that someone can watch on the cable network is also available on the internet, you've just devalued my cable bundle that people are paying for. So I'm not privy to those agreements, but you know, I think over time, because the technology allow, will, allows you as a consumer, me as a consumer, to say, I want ESPN, I want MLB Network, I want NFL Network, I want uh, A&E for my wife, I want Disney Channel for my son, and that's it. Why shouldn't I be able to just buy those five channels direct rather than having to buy a big bundle for a lot more money? And over time, I believe we're going to get to the point where you'll be able to do that. So, so and eventually I'm going to get to you, who's more of a new media right, yeah, startup with no side. baggage. But do you think going forward, the negotiations between, let's say, an ESPN or CNN and the cable operators and the, the satellite networks are going to move in the direction of... Comcast will probably pay less to ESPN per subscriber, and in exchange, ESPN will be able to do more kind of freewheeling and dealing in those same markets. I don't know, you know, so ESPN... Which, which, which actually would lead to ultimately what you've been talking about, which is better deals for the consumer because they don't have to pay as much. If Comcast is paying ESPN less, then they can't keep charging us as much as consumers. Right, well, but look at what Comcast is doing. So two different things happening. So one, Comcast is actually investing in the Comcast Sports Network. ESPN has started local. Comcast is investing in local sports with the idea that if they lose ESPN, they're still going to have something of value that you're going to want to subscribe to, which I think is very smart. ESPN, on the other hand, 
I mean, they're in basically every cable household. So 90 million cable households in the U.S. They get three to five dollars per household, even though a lot of them don't watch sports. They'd be stupid to, you know, circumvent that. Yeah. So, but the consumer is going to want, you know, and that's where I think it's really interesting to see the rise of networks devoted to individual sports leagues. So, yeah, I have ESPN, and yeah, ESPN is great. But you know what? I'm a baseball fan and a football fan. And if I could just subscribe to football and baseball, I wouldn't need an ESPN. Yeah. And that's with MLB.com and MLB NFL. Network, com. MLB.com. I subscribe to the Sunday ticket on DirecTV, but that gives me access to um, an online streaming version of it called Superfan, Supercast. That with my PC, I can watch any of those games anywhere. Now, I can't watch the ESPN game, which is uh, Monday Night Football. I can't watch the Sunday Night Football game. But since it's on broadcast, I can get it with my antenna. So it's, you know, over time, it's going to be interesting to watch that develop because um, I think the value of a cable multi-channel bundle will be devalued by what you can get online to the point where a lot less people subscribe on cable and many more people just cherry pick what they want and get it distributed to them via the Internet. Yeah. So now you come into this market with no baggage, right? You started a new company and you start producing content. How do you kind of look at the landscape in terms of, you know, obviously you push stuff out through the internet, but can you talk about your vision and strategy for pushing content out through different channels? Maybe what some of the, the barriers, challenges, or, or even on the positive side, the opportunities are, for example, striking a deal with a Comcast or, a direct TV or an exclusive deal with a YouTube online or, or kind of how do you approach the market from a, a distribution standpoint? So, so from our perspective, and yeah, Revision 3, we produce 20 shows. They're all weekly, some of them are daily. And um, we distribute them online. So, but we, and we really believe that it's anywhere, anytime, any device, any service, and any order of watching something. So. What we do is rather than saying, we're gonna limit you to this site, we're gonna limit you to watching here, it's up to you. You take it, watch it. You can watch it on your phone, you can watch it on your computer, you can watch it on your TV, you can watch it on your Kindle, if you could watch things on your Kindle. I don't care, as long as you watch it. So for us, we don't wanna do exclusives. I mean, if somebody paid us a lot of money, we would, obviously, because we are in business to make money. But really, our audience wants to be in control of the viewing experience. They wanna be able to watch it everywhere, and that's what we do for them. So that, that's almost in your DNA where any deal you're about to negotiate with somebody starts with, don't even ask us for even a window of exclusivity because that's, that's antithesis to, to, to how we want to approach the market and, and provide value to consumers. Yeah, because I believe people are everywhere. And, or, you know, viewers are everywhere and they want to watch without. But, you know, I mean, but again, somebody comes up to me and says, do something for us exclusive. You know, we certainly would consider it. But I, I think fundamentally... Most channels are going, you know, most content, you want to get it out everywhere because there is so much video content out there at, that finding it and discovering it, it becomes one of the biggest problems. So we have great stuff. Revision3.com, watch everything. But getting people to pay attention to it and find it is very tough. So what do we do? You know, being everywhere is good. Being on, working with the different distribution partners is good. But if Xbox, for example, came to us and said, love that show, give it to us, you know, exclusive for uh, a week, an exclusive window or a month, and we'll put it on the front page deck of every Xbox. I would do that for the exposure. But, you know, that's not happening. Yeah. It's not, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, call me Xbox. <laughs> so, so talk about some of those different distribution channels because I'm assuming on the Revision 3 website, it's an ad model, right? That's, you know, we get a million, five million, ten million people watching our content multiply that by a CPM and we're making money. Do you have other distribution channels where it's still, it's still something consumers can access at exactly the same time they can access it on your website, but maybe that's part of a subscription bundle? Like no, you know what, we, or... we don't really do any subscription bundles. People don't pay for our content. It's available for free. The way we monetize it primarily is through sponsorships in the show. Yeah. So because we have these hosts that are very connected to their audience and, you know, they've got great uh, millions of Twitter followers and they're all over Facebook. And um, when in the middle of the show, these hosts will stop the show and they'll say, look, now it's time to thank our sponsors. You know, this is free. It comes from 
know, the reason why you get it for free is because our sponsors pay the freight. So I want to thank Patron or Budweiser or Coors or GoDaddy or Squarespace or Netflix or um, Adidas. And there are a lot of them, so I'm going to forget at least 50 of them. But because it's part of the show, it's built in. Yeah, so it's not let's stop for a word from our sponsors. It's like the radio model where yeah, Howard Stern exactly. talks about, you know, all right, now let's talk about my favorite brand of ice cream, Haagen-Dazs. Klondike. Klondike. What would you do for a Klondike bar? Yeah. They're also a sponsor of ours. <laughs> um, but so we send the shows out with those sponsorships built in. So no matter where they're shown, the sponsorship is still there. So yeah, we do pre-rolls and overlays and post-rolls and all that. And our deals with our sponsorship partner, with our distribution partners are such that, you know, when they sell a pre-roll, they give us some of that. But that's a much smaller piece than the sponsorship in each episode. And when somebody watches the episode, they see the sponsorships and that just makes it bigger. So you and your sponsors win on all fronts regardless of distribution because it's not like they can extract Exactly, and it's all about that because if you believe anywhere, anytime, any device, any service, the viewer is in control of the viewing experience, then anywhere they watch, you want to make sure that your brands, the brands that are sponsoring that show travel along. And so that's what we're doing. Got it. All right, so for people who want to who want to be like Revision 3, you uh, just were a part of a panel where you, you gave some advice to the audience. So what were some of the takeaways from that panel? So it was on uh, distribution um, and aggregation. So ways to get your content out there. If you believe you want to be on all these different services, how do you do it? Well, it starts with, and one of the guys on the panel was um, um, Brett from TubeMogul. And TubeMogul is a great service. It will allow you to create a piece of content, upload it, to TubeMogul and they'll distribute it out to 20 or 30 sites. So that's uh, uh, 20 or 30 of the leading viral YouTube video sites. YouTube yep. and Daily Motion and Break and Blip and a lot of these guys. So that's the first step. The second step is as you start creating content on a regular basis. Um, you know, if you're creating multiple shows, create an automated feed so that you have a, an XML feed that you can give to TubeMogul, but also to other sites. So they can automatically ingest it as soon as you publish it. But so, so sticking with you, who, who would be some examples of other sites that are pulling in your RSS feed? Um, so uh, Mefedia, for example. Um, the uh, guys at Webcaster. Um, who else would that? And, and is that a negotiation or a convincing them to do Basically, it? Or, or yeah. is it just, yep. OK. Yeah, we talk to them. In there. Um, but also, um, you know, the guys at TubeMogul work with a lot of horizontal sites. So horizontal, like YouTube, you know, lots of content in lots of different places. But there are vertical sites out there as well. And if you, let's say you do a, sh a, a cooking show, right? A great show, amazing. How to cook jellyfish, okay? There are a lot of fans out there of cooking jellyfish. What you want to do is go out to, and this also came up in the panel, is to vertical sites. Like you want to go to jellyfishworld.com and get them to, to, to syndicate and import your jellyfish cooking videos. So you get a deal with jellyfish .com, jellyfishworld.com and that's where all, you know, you get a lot of, everybody goes there as a fan of jellyfish. That's a great audience for your jellyfish cooking video. And by having an RSS feed, you can get them to auto ingest it and take it in and put it out on their pages as soon as you publish your latest jellyfishing. With, with, with your, but with your content, is your, are your RSS feeds for the different shows publicly available? Mm -hmm. So, yep. so yep. somebody doesn't have to ask your permission. They could just start pulling it Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Just pull it off. You know, we like to know if somebody's going to take our content and re-ingest it and, and then send it out. You know, if they're going to reformat it or re-encode it, you know, just tell us how many people watched. Yeah. But if they're just using our feeds to pull it off of our server and deliver it, you know, yeah, it's fine. Like what Miro does, for example. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, we're, we're talking about kind of the dotting the I's and crossing the T's of distribution. Here are just the, the basic things you should be doing. It's use TubeMogul, upload it, get it on a bunch of sites. Uh, right, but here's, here's a, an interesting point, though. Even if you do do that with TubeMogul, make sure that you track where you're getting your views from. and um, Using their dashboard. Right, using their yeah. dashboard. And then because they have this sort of, you know, the, it's the same metadata that goes to all the sites, Go to those individual sites that are doing well for you and tweak the metadata for that site. Tweak the tags, tweak the description, tweak the headline, even the category. So that's one thing. Another thing that um, Brett brought up, brought up, which is very important to do, you can do this inside TubeMogul, but you can also do it at YouTube in their analytics area, is find out who's embedding your video. 
because you may find that people are embedding, sites are embedding your video, you never heard of them. Call them up, send them an email, see if you can get a relationship set up with them so that they're, so you have a, a real good relationship, so they embed all your stuff or more yeah. of your stuff. Somebody who embeds, who gives you views, is the most valuable person in the world. So, so the call is more of a, hey, so psyched you're, you're using our video, love it, like just wanted to introduce myself, let me know if I can be helpful in any way. I'll keep you updated as, you know, I'll let you know in advance like what the next episode's or, gonna be. Or even I'll give you um, an exclusive for a day or I'll give you sort but of I the thought you don't do exclusives. You know, if somebody's giving me a lot of viewership, okay. I will definitely, you know, I mean, and, and we've, you know, there, there have been, I mean, certain video works better for certain sites as well. So for example, you know, we had this one video we were running, you know, it was good on a lot of places, but for Ebaum's world, it was great. Because Ebaum's world is crazy and wacky and over the top. And it's like those guys, I'm like, I'm just going to give it to you guys. You know, yeah. I'll put it everywhere else, but I'm really going to work with you to optimize it for your audience. Yeah. And, and did you give them some sort of like a day exclusive? I have or? not. No, we didn't do okay. that. But, you know, you could do that as well. I mean, that's one of the things that came up on the panel is those kinds of exclusives can work for, you know, if, if that's something you want to do. Okay, what were some of the other uh, deep thoughts that came from the panel? Uh, you know, another one I think is to make sure that, uh, you know, once you get out and you're working with all these distribution partners is, you know, get to know them as people and sort of work with them to figure out what they need, whether it's YouTube or Jellyfishing World, you know, Jellyfish World, you get to know them and, you know, work with them because it's not just send it and hope it goes, but send it and then work it. Well, g g give me an example. I mean, you're you're a pretty big fish, so I'm assuming when you call YouTube, they respond. No, they well, no. <laughs> I mean, we have a good relationship with YouTube, but there's so many creators out yeah. there. But 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 what what would be an example of a conversation you had with a YouTube where you asked them, hey, what what can we do differently, or what do you want to see more of? Well, so and YouTube is a good example where once you're in the partner program, um, there's a special website area where they uh, exchange information with partners. And sometimes they do spotlights, and it's a good place to find out a spotlight that's coming up where you can craft video for it. So, for example, like they did that, a, back a th Thanksgiving spotlight yeah, probably or, coming up. Right, they did a back to school spotlight, you know, and we, although they didn't end up picking it up, we, our show Scam School, which is about how to scam free drinks from your friends at the bar using magic, um, is a very sort of, you know, back to school sort of thing. So yeah. I thought it was perfect. They didn't end up taking it, but. But that's the kind of insight you get when you sort of so, focus so, in. So you at least know their editorial calendar of featured stuff on their homepage so you can produce stuff that relates to it and hope that it may not get picked, but at least you have a good chance of Exactly, and like the guys at Ebaum's world. I mean, I talk to the content guys there on a regular basis. I'm like, hey, look, I have this really wacky offbeat thing. I think it'd be good for you. Why not? And they look at it like, yeah, okay. And they put it on the homepage and it gets, you know, 50,000 views, which yeah. is great. Yeah. That works. Yeah. So let's let's talk about uh, some issues that are probably being discussed here. Uh, you shoot a lot of. Do you shoot everything in HD? Uh, all HD. Okay. And what's your infrastructure like? I mean, what are you? Who are you using? Do you use CDNs? Or are you built, yeah, we did you build out your own platform? No, no, no. So we use uh, we shoot in HD, Final Cut Pro to edit. We use Bit Gravity for our CDN. Uh, we use TubeMobile to upload. Um, it's pretty basic. Okay. Yeah, I mean, BitGravity is a great CDN, but there's a bunch of others out there. We don't use, um, you know, somebody like Bright Cove or um, uh, other ones like that. They're great platforms for people, especially if you're just starting out and don't want to build your player out and all that. We have our own player, you know, Bright Cove, Blip, um, Viddler. Um, there's a whole bunch of them that are all really good at varying levels. I mean, Bright Cove is a very high end one. Well, they just came out with a cheap version. Yeah. Um, I think that was dollar announced version, this right? past week. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the guys at Viddler are great for a much lower level, um, less expensive version. Blip is also very good, and they'll sell ads for you. So there, there are different ones that you can use, but, you know, those partners can be very good. So you obviously had to time the, the we're going to do all HD with the moment where CDNs could actually handle HD and deliver a variable bit rate. So can you talk kind of about that whole process? Well, we were doing HD, you know, we've been doing it for a couple of years. And, you know, bit gravity hasn't really been doing, they're, they're not in the delivering of variable bit rate stuff. So we actually create, I don't know, seven or eight different versions and upload them to bit gravity. And then uh, has have, and then we serve you know, certain ones based on what people ask for. So we have so a big HD, we have a little HD, we have 
you know, Windows Media. We so, have. So, so when somebody, so let's say me at home on a DSL line, when I hit your site and click on play, does it do some sort of auto detect to decide we, what the first? We deliver a high speed flash version or a, a high end flash version, but you have the ability to go to a low lower res flash version. Okay, so, so you, with me as as the end user, you start me at the highest version, and then if I notice it buffering, I'm not sure if we start it, at the higher or lower. I can't remember. Okay, but both they're both available. It's a little toggle switch. YouTube has the same thing. Got it. Okay, so another kind of topic and issue is around metadata. Mm -hmm. And where do you, I mean, obviously with all these platforms, I can type in keywords, I can type in a description, those are searchable, indexable. But in terms of things like, for example, the dig show, do you, do you, are you starting to play around with getting that, con, you know, the, the dialogue transcribed so that more stuff is? You know, we did transcription of dialogue for a little while <coughs> with an auto transcription service. It didn't really do anything. It didn't move the needle at all. Um, what I think is more interesting is tweaking the headlines, the descriptions, the metadata, especially on YouTube because you know YouTube's the second biggest search engine out there, but they don't know what's inside the video. So what you put in it and then the comments around it are very important. We're also um, you know, breaking up the video into different chunks and then optimizing each one of those like a piece of a story on Dignation. I'm also doing some tests on um, uploading the same video to two different places and giving it different headlines and titles and seeing which ones work. Just, there's a lot well, of players. Yeah, I was going to say, almost like how an advertiser, you know, puts up uh, two versions of right. an ad. It could be the blue with this headline and then the blue with that headline, the red with the first headline, the red with the second headline. Well, and also, um, the thumbnail is very important too. So, you know, yes, thumbnails of naked women work really well, but it's not really, we don't really do content where that makes sense. Maybe you but, should start doing that. No, nah, you know what? Our brand is not that. Um, but there are good thumbnails that can really help draw someone in and get them to click as well. So it's those grabbers are very important, and uh, it's definitely an art to try and figure out what the right ones are. Yeah. Um, in terms of users, how, how do, you, do you hope that consumers for the different shows interact with the brands in different ways? Or what, what are, how, how do you want to? What makes you happy with a Dignation viewer or another show's viewer? Like, what, what are they doing in a participatory way that well, makes you happy? Well, I love when they forward the video around, obviously, and tell their friends. But when they talk about what's happening in the show, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or um, email or other places, I like when they mention the brands and talk about the brands that sponsor. Um, and then all the way up to buying a product or service from our sponsors. Yeah. So how do you measure that stuff? Uh, well, on the buying a product or service from sponsors, usually we use codes. So on GoDaddy, it's register for your domain, get 10% off with, with uh, Dig1 or Squarespace. You know, register for Squarespace, get 10% off the life of your order by using Rev1 or one of those codes. So otherwise, you know, we can track visits to websites, we track mentions online. Um, yeah, there's a couple, there's a lot of different ways to track and it, it's, a, it's an emerging area too. They're, they're, it's not as easy as I would like. But, well, that's what I was going to ask. So, for example, monitoring kind of the exhaust of Twitter, what, what tools are you using? Because I'm assuming ultimately you want to be able to go back to the sponsors the next time and say, look, yeah. right after Kevin said, right, uh, mentioned yep. your company, here's just the, the, the popcorn popping. Yeah, so we do. I mean, TweetDeck is a great one to use. Um, there's even Twitter search. The search on Twitter is good. And there's some higher end tools that we're not using. Um, but that I certainly would love to, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about exploring and playing around with that allow you to track different comments of things. You can even go to Google Alerts and set up an alert for your for the brand. For We do it like show, brand, uh, show name brand, host name brand, host Twitter handle brand, those sorts of things, and track those. And, and then basically your sales team can aggregate yeah, that you aggregate data and, and say, go Look, back to the... There were 10 mentions, you were advertising, there were you know 500 mentions, and then it went down to 10 mentions again when you stopped. After the show, yeah. Or whatever the number is. Yeah. Got it. Um, in, in terms of, the, let's talk about the creative side. So you have 20 shows, right? And they each kind of focus on different niche verticals. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're going to keep on building those shows out, but what are there any new verticals you're going to go after in the next uh, couple months? Yeah, I mean, you know, we our, our goal is to super serve this you know, 18 to 34 millennial male audience, and so we're I'm a part of that audience. Yeah, all right. So, what are you interested in? Um, so, 
Uh, you know, we've got tech, we've got movies, we've got video games, we've got um, comic books, we've got sort of the internet culture. Um, there are others that are obviously, you know, you look out there that, are, that appeal to that audience. I mean, we're not doing anything with cars right now. Cars are a big deal. We're, you know, we're, we're not doing anything with cooking, and there are aspects of cooking that are interesting. Uh, we're not doing anything on travel. We're not doing anything. So those are all areas that we, you know, are looking at. We don't have anything to announce to get into, but we're certainly looking at all those areas to see if there's anything cool that works, that fits our brand. And then has, has every series been an in-house creation? No, about half acquire? we in-house, the other half we acquire. Okay, so you'll see somebody who's doing something cool in comic books as an example yep. and say, hey, we'd love to, like, let us buy you and we can give you our yeah, entire we'll, infrastructure. We'll make you a Vision 3 show and we'll, we'll promote you, we'll sell you, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, distribute you and all those things that we're really good at. Well, cool. Any, uh, any other deep thoughts or insights you want to... You know what, it's a, it's the, the world is changing very quickly and we are at the beginning of this sort of transformation, not the end. And where we end up at the end, I don't think anybody can really say. So for us, we're trying lots of different things, and we'll see what happens. So you're throwing a lot of spaghetti against the wall right. and seeing what sticks. Exactly. Great. All right, Jim, I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. And we will